Hello. Well, it's often been said that the character and style of a town is reflected in its football club, and nowhere is that truer than in Yorkshire. Over the next three weeks, we'll be sampling a little of that character. First, Barnsley, with memories of a cup triumph going back to before the First World War. Then Huddersfield, a club with a long and distinguished First Division history. For Huddersfield, it was the triumphant twenties with a hat-trick of league wins and three cup finals to save her. Sheffield United, one of the two great clubs in the city of Steel. United champions and cup winners in the last century, a club whose greatness cannot be measured by their current league position, even in a promotion year. And Sheffield Wednesday, one of the oldest among the league clubs. We'll be jogging memories which take in a consistent record of cup and league wins, with four championship trophies and five cup final appearances. Well, that's what's in prospect over the next three weeks. And it's in South Yorkshire that we start with Barnsley. It's always seemed to me that the blood-red shirt of Barnsley symbolises the sweat and toil of life in the capital of the South Yorkshire coalfield. The men who've worn that shirt with pride always seem to play with an earthy resolve that says volumes for their determination not to be beaten. Barnsley are nobody's pushovers. They may not be one of the game's glamour clubs, indeed Oakwell on a grey day can be a foreboding, almost haunting prospect for visitors. But Barnsley is a friendly club, proud of its tradition, and like any family, closely knit. It was a parson, the Reverend T. T. Preedy, who laid the foundations for the birth of Barnsley St. Peter's Football Club in 1887. A memorable rise to fame was not far away. But it's perhaps characters rather than cups that highlight Barnsley's history. Even the names of the players somehow suit the club. George Donkin, Ruff Fletcher, Skinner Normanton. Men with names and faces like that could never play for Chelsea. But what of Danny Blanchflower and his Irish skill and charm? He could have played for Chelsea. In fact, he managed them before skippering Spurs to the double. And then there were the skills of Arthur Kay and the goals of Tommy Taylor. Michael Parkinson, Barnsley's best-known fan, would have had all of them on his chat show, and Gordon Pallister, Jimmy Baxter, and many others. Well, two of those great names are with me in the studio, Danny Blanchflower and Parky's pal, Sidney Skinner Normanton. Together, we'll paint a picture of a club that's had so many memorable days. <laughs> the days, Barnsley in the 20s were a formidable proposition, even though they could never quite get into the first division. The cobbled streets rang to the sound of clogs, the Oakwell air positively crackled on match days. There was the traditional bovril and the after-match inquests which stretched from the pub on Saturday night through to first shift at the pit on Monday morning. Today, Barnsley Football Club is on the march again. Nelly and Nancy, who've given 32 years service to the club between them, reckon the present team is as good as any to have worn these well-ironed shirts, but the fluffy mascot has seen it all before. These young men are the future of Barnsley. On grey and misty mornings, they learn their trade, spurred on by mentors who command the utmost respect. It's been a good season. They've recalled those halcyon days, and perhaps the present stars will be as well remembered as the greatest names, Johnny Steele and Gordon Pallister. This club, I was speaking on my behalf, and I'm sure John agrees with me, that this has been my life. And I'd like to say this, I, I'd, I'd die a happy man if this club got in, in the first division for the first time in its, its history, I'd die a happy man. I think it's a great little club, Bounty Football Club, and probably one of the best in the country. I think the spectators of this town are wonderful. You give them the goods and on the field, they'll come and support you. And they're a great crowd. Great little town and a great little club. Gordon, what memories does looking out on the pitch evoke for you? Well, I came here in 1938 from Bradford City and uh, there were wonderful memories, particularly the team in those days before the war. I thought it was probably the best team that Barnsley have had in my uh, association, long association with the club. And, but for the war, I think that team would possibly have gone straight through and got into the first division. Mm. John, Excellent team. John, you came down from Scotland. What were your first thoughts when you arrived in Barnsley? Well, not very good when I saw the town as it was then, the cobbled streets and being wakened up at six o'clock in the morning by miners going to work and foot as they did then. <laughs> uh, 
And I honestly thought, well, I'll only be here a month or two and then I'll be on my way back. But, as you know, events proved otherwise. Uh, having lived in this town for a few months, I, I really got to love the place, the people and the football. He's done a fair job, hasn't he, Gordon, actually, when you think back over all those well, years? Well, you see, John has been here all these years and he, I think he's had every job at the football club. He's been player, he's been coach, he's been manager, he's been secretary and now he's general manager. In the 50s, Barnsley unearthed a gem of a centre forward. Tommy Taylor was England's successor to Lawton, Milburn and Loft House. But tragedy struck with the Munich air disaster. Fate was cruel, Taylor's life was lost. But Steele, who discovered him, has never forgotten him. Tommy would have gone on to play for England for years, I'm certain of Indeed. that. He was, I always rated him with the Tommy Lawton's with his head work. He was a great header of a ball, Tommy. And could finish with either foot, could shoot with either foot. A very good type of lad good type of lad. We, uh, we love Tommy here and uh, it was tragic for us when he had to go but even more so of course mm. when he lost his life. I thought John that uh, it was uh, every manager's dream of the yes. perfect centre forward because he had aerial power, he had power on the ground and th that boy but uh, for the tragic accident he would have broken all records, goal scoring records in my opinion anyhow yeah. and possibly got more caps than any other centre forward in the country, yeah, in the history of the game. And a good lad. Good and a great lad. Yeah. Now then, let's move on to a certain legendary Skinner Normanton, who seems to have be, become more famous since he finished playing than he was at the time. Gordon? Well, Sid was uh, is a very, very strong player and a devastating tackle, you know. He's the sort of player that you'd rather play with than against. Uh, a very good lad to have in your team, a hundred percenter and a destroyer. What I, not a creator, but a destroyer. Well, that's what Parky's always put across, isn't he? That he was absolutely terrifying. Was he as terrifying as he makes out? It, well, I, I should imagine. I've seen a lot of players, uh, if it's been a 50-50 ball, uh, I've seen a lot of players jerk away from Normanton. Here at Barnsley, they had a bit of a folk hero and a left winger called Johnny Kelly, didn't they? Tell me oh, about him. Wonderful player. John was a very talented, uh, gifted uh, individual. And we always used to say that when he was playing, he'd put two or 3,000 people on the gate uh, because he because of his ability he wasn't a great team player he was an individual but he was an entertainer the crowd loved him he was a bit frustrating was he yes